My writing process is, in terms of my discipline, is the same regardless of what the material that I'm working on, and it was no different for all the way. Uh, I rise early. I'm at my desk by 8.30. I write till noon or 1 o'clock. I take a break. I have lunch. I take a nap. Um, I rarely write in the afternoons unless I'm under deadline, but I might spend that time prepping myself for the next day's work. In terms of my approach to all the way, um, first there was this period of absorption and just trying to get my arms around this enormous story so that I could make the most fundamental decisions, where to begin and where to end. Um, and I suppose the first question is, well, which part of the story do you want to tell? Because you could dive in anywhere and it would be great. You could make it about LBJ's first Senate campaign, the one he lost. Or you could make it about his second Senate campaign, the one he, you know, landslide Lyndon, the one he won with those handful of votes that magically appeared there in the Rio Grande Valley. You could make it about any part of the presidency you wanted to. I very quickly settled on the accidental president, the, the first term, November 63, immediately after the assassination of John F. Kennedy in Dallas, uh, and culminating in LBJ's own re-election in his own right as president 11 months later in November 1964. <clears throat> There's a beautiful historic arc within that of someone who comes into power, who has sought power all his life, all his life. This is what he's wanted. He finds himself there, not in the way he would have liked to arrive, but he's there now. And the big question on everybody's mind is, what does Lyndon want? What will he do? Who, who, which Lyndon Johnson will this be? Will this be the liberal Lyndon Johnson, the progressive New Dealer Lyndon Johnson? Will this be the Southern conservative Lyndon Johnson? Which one is going to show up? What does Lyndon Johnson want? And it turns out what Lyndon Johnson wants is social justice. Lyndon Johnson wants to see and in fact muscles through the 1964 Civil Rights Act, the landmark Civil Rights Act, the most impressive civil rights legislation since Reconstruction, and begins to lay in motion practically the most uh, monumental reorganization of government in this country, and particularly government in its relationship to the people in terms of services it provides, since the New Deal, the Great Society. At the same time, we also see um, Tonkin Gulf, the Tonkin Gulf Resolution, and the beginning of the lying that will take us into the morass that is Vietnam, uh, deeper into the morass, I should say, that is Vietnam. Um, so once I had settled on the parameters of the story for all the way, then it was a question of looking at the overall arc of that story, where to break uh, the act, um, what the focus of the first act should be, strict, just talking in strictly plotting terms, and uh, the focus of the second act. And um, while the election, because he's, he's a politician first and foremost, is never far removed from Lyndon Johnson's mind, beginning from the first day he assumes power in the, in the office, the first act largely is concerned with the passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. The second act becomes the build-up to the election, and, and we watch as LBJ tries to maintain all these disparate groups, try to wrangle uh, an increasingly fractious Democratic Party as he nears the convention, um, and while simultaneously the civil rights movement is beginning to, sh to undergo its own uh, shaky evolution um, and culminating then in his landslide victory, which, which uh, as uh, monumental as it was uh, in just electoral terms, 
still has within what we as the audience can recognize the seeds of, of its own downfall. So then once I have settled on the overall arc, it's beginning, then I begin to outline a little bit more in detail. I don't typically do a thorough outline when I'm writing a play. Uh, when I write for film or television, I write a very detailed treatment. Um, it could be as many as uh, anywhere from 30 to 70 pages of outline for a document that will ultimately be 120 pages. For a play, I typically don't um, do that much outlining, but because this is um, based on historical material, there's a lot of detail, there are many, many moving parts, I did a little bit more outlining than I would normally do, um, while still leaving myself plenty of room to uh, discover uh, uh, events, uh, moments as they occur, which for me as the writer, uh, I'm doing this now for four decades, is still the most pleasurable and exciting part of the process, to sit down and write something that I had not intended to write, uh, a scene, a moment, a line, something unplanned, to surprise myself, in other words, with something is, affords me a delight uh, and a pleasure that's really quite unlike anything else, and I still take an almost childlike pleasure in it. Um, so then I, I sat down, I, 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 should, I should say at this point that I'm, I'm not doing this entirely on my own. Uh, I am working, for example, with uh, my longtime dramaturg and research associate and professional colleague, Tom Bryant, who I worked with, who I met 21 years ago on the Kentucky Cycle. And Tom and I have worked off and on over the years, and I brought him in immediately on this. Um, he's a terrific critical mind and extremely uh, important to this process. So, so I have someone there I can bounce ideas off with, someone who, who I'm working with as I try to, to wrangle this material into shape, and then, and then I sit down and write a draft. And, and I, try to, I try to get it on paper, knowing that it's crude, that um, it's just, it'll be sketchy, um, you know, it will change a lot. But the important thing is to get it down to get it down on paper. I liken, particularly a play like this, which is so complicated, and so many moving parts, um, to an oil painting. You, you lay down a coat, and then you go back and you put down a second coat, and then you put down a third coat, and each time you're putting down a coat, you're, you're addressing maybe just one aspect of the picture, of the broader picture. I'm gonna focus here on theme, or here I'm focusing on a plot moment, or here I'm focusing on a character. And, and, uh, and gradually over time, with this buildup of layer after layer after layer, then, then the true thing begins to emerge uh, and take shape. Um, I'm working, of course, on commission with the Oregon Shakespeare Festival, and they are providing me the opportunity at any time during this to have it read out loud by actors, which is, once you've, once you've got it down on paper and you've begun to see it, it becomes increasingly more important to, to have those words in somebody else's mouth, to get it out of my head and, and hear other artists begin to wrestle with it. And just the experience of hearing it read, sitting around a table, it's nothing more fancy or formal than that. Um, and to hear the questions that, uh, that these artists raise as they grapple now with this material in their very, very narrowly focused way. I'm playing Hubert Humphrey, and so I have a question about Humphrey in this moment. Well, they ask me a question, and it forces me to think. It forces me to not defend my material, but to be sure that I've really articulated my material as carefully as I thought I had. And, and then there are the... Um, you know, working with as talented a group of people as I was, you, they are also bringing things to the table and you see them do something or say something and it triggers a whole new idea for yourself, um, which is extremely useful in the process. So there was a series of readings over time uh, with increasingly larger groups of actors as we began to approach sort of full size. 
um, culminating actually in um, a full reading of the play in January of 2012 um, with the cast that I would be using, with only one or two exceptions, uh, four months before we would actually go into rehearsal and a kind of extraordinary opportunity and something that's really only possible in a true repertory theater like the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. Um, so that's my, that's my process as I, as I approach uh, uh, rehearsal. Of course, of course, the closer I get to rehearsal, then there are other artists who are beginning to involve themselves. There's a set designer. There's a costume designer. There's a lighting designer. There's a property designer. Um, hair and wigs. Um, and, and, and all of these people have questions about how this feels and how this looks and what's the texture. And, and, uh, and all of these things, uh, again, push me towards greater and greater specificity. They force me time and time again to refine and redefine what it is that I'm about here, what is important to me. Um, this is a, 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 in this instance, it was a joyous uh, process. It isn't always, uh, but in this case it was. It was a terrific group of designers and everybody's incredibly supportive of my vision here. And um, so we are gradually, this, this transfer of this thing that lived just in here, out there, and is now being shared by all these other people uh, until finally we are actually in a theater, in a 500 seat house, and there are 17 actors on stage, and there are, you know, there's a design and technological team of maybe 30, 40 people all around me, all focused on bringing this idea into very real, living, breathing life. Um, so that's the process of development.